Welcome everyone. I'm Mark with Advanced Assembly and we're here for Mark Voids a Warranty. That's right. Each week I I don't want to say I play God because that might might offend some people. But uh I really do decide who lives and dies. So, it, we'll call it a mm, vengeful spirit. I'll go with vengeful spirit. So every now and again, I get an electronic board that I design and it doesn't work as I like. Now, I do find it's, uh, if not effective, it's at least cathartic to destroy things and take them apart and then pin them to my office wall so the other electronics know to fear me and uh, do my bidding as I please and as they should. But that's not what we're doing today. Nope, today we're going to take a look at battery chargers, and I've got a few of us, a few of them here for us to look at, except I use these battery chargers, so uh, whatever we do needs to be non-destructive so we can put it back together and I can keep using it. But before we do, there's two things I'd like to talk to you about. The first is a web course that we're starting October 11th, 2021 at teachmepcb.com. And what we're going to teach you how to do is design a circuit board using a Raspberry Pi Pico and some switches. This is not ours. This one I got from uh, uh, Pi Maroni, I think. Anyways, you can program the switches to do whatever it is that you want them to do and uh, act as little macros. Like you could program a switch to be uh, control S and you could just, you know, you press it and then it'll auto save your work every five minutes in whatever program you're in. Press it again to stop. That's a macro. It's kind of a shortcut and you can, you can do it. So anyhow, if you're at all interested in something like that, um, Join us. The second thing I'd like to talk to you about is something called the silicone shortage. And for that, I have a prop, I think. Got some very sticky tape. Okay. These things are delicate. And once they leave the clean room, they're not all that useful, but they were never really meant to be. Ooh, let's use this one. There we go. This is a 100 millimeter silicone wafer, four inch. And it's probably hard to see on this view. I'll switch to the uh, microscope here in a second. But what we've got are, you know, dozens to hundreds of little microchips. And I wanted to show those to you for a moment and tell you about some of the difficulties that we are currently facing in the electronics industry. So this is a silicone wafer, and what we're looking at is, uh, I'm seeing all sorts of transistors, gates, a CPU, memory. So well, it looks like what we're looking here is a little microprocessor of some sort. Um, it could be a microcontroller, I don't really know. It, it's not striking me as rel as very new technology. This could be something from a decade or two ago. But see all these little these little things uh, on the screen here, and I apologize for the um, the shakiness of that camera. It's cantilevered out there. But what you're looking at is all of these things are what's inside today's computer chips. And they have different functions. There's different layers built up, up atop silicone. Um, you know, they, they'll dope it with PNN dopants. Um, make all these cool little shapes. Well, the trouble is that all of this takes some amount of time to create. And the world has, I don't want to say run out, but they've exceeded manufacturing capacity and shipping capacity by a large margin. There's a lot of reasons for that, and people smarter than me can write and tell you about it, but the short issue is that 
there isn't enough of this stuff around right now. So if you're designing a board, um, you might not be able to get a hold of this stuff. And this is the stuff that's in every integrated circuit that's out there. Um, you know, here I've got just two examples for you. Let me see if I can't show you a third. I need to get some more paper in between those. These are smaller ones. And you might have heard about transistors and all that or sort of stuff. This is, as, you know, this isn't even as small as we can make them now. This is as small as we could make them 20 years ago. And it's been halving in size ever since. Anyhow, if you're an electronics designer, now's a bad time to be an electronics designer because you can't get the stuff that you need to go inside your computer chips to go inside your projects. Um, lead times, the time it takes to order something, some of those things have been pushed out to a year. And I'm sure that's a year if you're lucky and they don't push it back again. Anyhow, um, difficult time to be an engineer because you can't get the parts that you need to make the designs that you want to make. I don't know what you do about that. Uh, you have to design around the problem, design with the parts that you have available. And really what I recommend is do what I'm doing. Um, uh, the box is a little far away, but basically once I decide I'm going to use a part in a project, I drop it in the shopping cart, order it, get it shipped here. And then when I'm ready to make my boards, I'm going to ship my box of stuff out to the assembly house, consign it over to them, and then let them build it. It's the only way I know that I'm going to have the parts I need when I need them without doing major respins or going lying down. Anyhow, with that, let's take a look at what we have today. We've got Ryobi battery chargers. Check out these little guys. These charge the 18 volt line of, of battery. The newer gen seem to have little wall wart power supplies that go to a really lightweight, I mean the whole system's very lightweight. And then just before that, or after that, I don't know, but still a similar design, just a slightly different base shape. We've got another one about the same weight. A rapid multi-chemistry charger. This is the one that I'm really interested to get into today you know, plugs into the wall. All of the line level circuitry we will be in here. And uh, then, time permitting, I also have an Amazon charger from last week that we can take a look at. So let's go ahead and get started, yeah? It'll be fun. Let's see where my camera is. Um, no? close there we go we got both on screen okay so this is the charger you've got connector goes to the wall and over on the back side here we've got these little security screws now I had to go dig out in the garage for this one a little earlier today this is what the mating piece looks like. Uh, if you're able to see that, it's a little spline drive with a hole in the middle and goes right in. If they really wanted to slow me down, what they could have done is make these holes deeper. How much deeper? I don't know, but If they really wanted to, to put some security into it, recessing those things further back would certainly make it more difficult for me to do something about, about it. I mean, I would have had to go out and buy a new driver. Which might have angered me enough not to take this thing apart. Whoop, wrong button there. Let's just back up a little. The good news for Ryobi is once I'm done, this thing's going back together so I can charge my drills. 
And I know you're out there thinking, well, what are you doing using drills or Ryobi or whatever? I like Ryobi. Um, a lot of people, you know, they'll, the tradies, the people that are using these things 20 hours a day, you know, they'll go get a Milwaukee or, or, or whatever. Um, for what I do, the Ryobi stuff's fine. It's less expensive. I've never had a product fail, not once. I mean, I've got a lot of Ryobi OnePlus stuff and yeah, the batteries go after a few years, but that's to be expected. But I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm not using them every day, probably using them at least every month, maybe even every week, but not every day. And it's just fine. Okay, we've got one screw that's being difficult. Might need to come out a little bit more. Okay, there we go. Let me start a parts bin here. And we have our first look. This is a line powered device. You always want to make sure that your line is unplugged whenever you open one of these up. And it's not a bad idea either. So if I have one handy, I'll show you how to lock this thing out, at least temporarily. These look a little wide, but one of the things you can do, although this won't work for me today because these are a little too wide, is put a, uh, a zip tie through the pins and prevent it from being plugged in, right? But anyhow. All right, so here is our first look at the board. Quite a bit of, of circuitry involved in a battery charger. I'll tell you, a few years ago, I was looking into making a battery charger circuit. Uh, it was just a demo project. I didn't actually need a battery charger circuit, but it looked like it had a lot of ability to to teach stuff. Excuse me for one moment. Come here, buddy. Our friend Chester the cat is saying hi. All right. Anyhow, there's a lot that goes on in battery charger circuitry. So I was thinking about maybe making a battery charger circuit. No, it is a thing and a half. You know, it'll, it'll tell you depending on the battery chemistry you know, let's say you're doing a lithium ion. You know, you've got to charge at, you know, X number of amps for so many seconds. And then you've got to, you know, and once the voltage reaches this level, you've got to change it and do this for this many seconds and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Really, the only way to do it is with a specifically designed integrated circuit. Trying to come up with your own setup just wouldn't be worth it. All right. So we are now well into it. Excuse me for one moment here. I've got a phone. It keeps beeping at me. I'm going to put it in airplane mode. There you go. All right. So here is our inside of the circuit so far. Set the plastic part off to the side. There's a lot of some sort of caulking or potting. I don't know what that is. But they're doing this to hold things in place all over the place. You know, all this stuff. Not terrifically interesting. It does make repair difficult. I guess we could pry it off if we needed to bunch of resistors, transistors, a lot of the surface mount on one side and then the through hole parts on this side. So let's see what it is that there is to see on this thing. So starting at the back and coming in, it looks like we've got a fuse that is is that replaceable with, is that an end cap? I don't know. I mean, it certainly could be replaced one way or another, but it's certainly not meant to be user serviceable. That would be difficult to get out. Uh, we've got 
a little cap and I'm not sure what that green thing is if that is a protection circuit or what the schematic symbol underneath it appears to be that of a resistor but I'm not really aware of a resistor in that package let's see what is it does it give us a part number prefix a ref des NTC 101 I'm not familiar with that so if you guys know what that is let me know in the comments below from there we hit an isolation transformer and then that goes into I assume the rectifier does it have four leads on the bottom it does so this is our rectifier circuit so AC up to this point and then we start turning it into DC one of the things that you have to worry about whenever you do go AC to DC is the ripple current that's going to exist in your capacitors uh, if you've got a large ripple current you know um, you get dual heating and that can be a problem uh, as far as heat dissipation goes so AC we're keeping everything separate for creepage and clearance concerns then somewhere around here we move into um, DC and then from here on out we should have lower voltage DC a lot of the stuff that you know that you'll see with power supply design versus um, a digital or an, even an analog is the copper pores you can't have copper because you can get short circuits so just large big traces um, if you're ever wondering how you figure out what those things are it used to be IPC 2221 that covered that stuff except that that data was all just made up by a couple scientists back in the 50s and engineers kept using it so IPC 2152 replaced it and that's all well and good but IPC 2152 is hidden behind a paywall so if you um, head over to aapcb.com forward slash blog and you go back a couple gears you'll find a bunch of charts I made that help you ballpark um, copper trace width for a given current and a given temperature rise and you can figure out what what those things need to be all right as we go through here if you do have any questions that you would like to ask um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask I'd be happy to answer them somebody asked here um, oh it's us if you do have any parts send them to AA and we'll hold them in inventory yeah that's true too instead of shipping them to your own house you can ship them to AA and make it their problem they'll put it on a shelf until you're ready to go all right so then we've got some controller circuitry we'll get that under the microscope in just a second um, and then there's a bunch of space and why do we have another maybe this is a uh, a buck converter in this part of the design I do have a couple big uh, what appear to be MOSFETs so maybe after we get into DC we've probably got you know 70 volt DC and then our buck converter probably steps it down into more manageable things you know the 18 volts the 5 volts or 3 volts that run the circuitry and then by the time we get over to this part we've got relatively low voltages that we're dealing with so interesting well let's take a look at it under the microscope shall we see what else there is to notice seems Chester has calmed down and accepted his new life in his cat bed it's funny he only makes noise when I'm on air I don't know what's going on with that cat all right so going from the power input again <clears throat> So going from this corner we've got some oh that's interesting 
just some ESD fingers um, trying to create a spot if this you know if there is going to be a short circuit or a high voltage jump I think it's creating a location where that is intended to happen I don't do much of this type of line power design stuff um, I have seen those before <clears throat> but I want to say there's um, there's newer ways of doing that but I'm not sure because that is a little bit outside my experience zone quite the array of part size discrepancies like you've got something here which is a little you know six pin SOIC component um, what appears I mean it's always hard to tell sizes but that's like a SOT 223 0805s mixed in with just giant components on the other side That's an interesting feature. Why that's cut through, I couldn't even begin to tell you. Don't know if that's on purpose or on accident. Same thing here. Why not just connect it over? And I don't know. Maybe those are just ginormous traces. You know, they set up their routing for... I don't even know what that is right off. Let's call it 300 mil. I don't think it's that big, but it's pretty big. Then as we cruise on over, it's a relatively simple, clean, old school two layer board. I like it. And then back on the other side, they've got some test points integrated right into it here. So the negative battery, 5 volt test point, uh, RXTX, so some diagnosed, well, that might even be a programming header. I'm not sure. I have no need to probe it to find out, especially while it's plugged in. It's a good way to wake you up in the morning. But... Every time you get electrocuted, it takes like five years off your life or something. I don't know. Good news is those are the years at the end, and they're crappy anyway. All right. Well, that is interesting. We are stopping the tear down there because I am putting that back together. All right, let's see if there's anything to be seen here. So now I've got the same connectors. You can see straight down into them. Oh, those tricky boogers. They got me. Remember how I was saying, if you didn't want somebody to open up your case. Like over here. If you don't want somebody to open up your case, make those holes deeper. Well, the other thing you can do, too, is not just deeper, but see how this is narrower? Well, a hex bit just won't fit inside. I'm not even touching the bottom of the case there. I can't take it apart. Those tricky, tricky boogers. Now, I could take this out to a grinder and, and take off a little bit of this and make it make it fit but who has that kind of energy so Ryobi one mark one let's see what we have as far as these Amazon things go let's see if I have a new bin ready to go all right Christian I hope you're watching because it's time for a little Mark Smash. <laughs> Let's see here if I can get an overhead view going for you. Okay, there we go. And I seem to have changed the...
accidentally change the transition type. Now, these things are almost always glued shut, and there's not a whole lot you can do to get into them uh, safely. Sometimes heat works. You can heat them up and slowly get things out. Or, if you're lucky, you can break the glue joints. Although I don't hear anything that sounds like cracking, even remotely. That was a crack. Bravo, Amazon. Bravo. That thing is still glued together. I gotta say, that, that was a decent amount of glue. I mean, we could have tried heat. Would have taken longer. May or may not have worked. I don't know. But uh, there's one. The connectors just clip into place. So this lets them assemble it. It also might let them swap out for different countries. I don't know. I don't know about the spacing or if this is just simply an assembly technique. But let's see if we can't zoom in a little more and let you guys take a look. So here is our circuit. It's, I mean, relatively simple. There's not much to this. This is the part that was glued in and I beat on until it gave up. And these connectors slide into here or more appropriately here there we go these connectors slide right into there when it's put together so you've got a PCB I don't see much in the way of I don't know if it's just silk screened over, but it doesn't look like there's any copper on this side. It looks like we're looking right at, um, just right at fiberglass. Got a transformer with what is that a? So the weird thing is usually transformers they go straight down. Um, this one looks like it connects out over to the side over here somewhere. And I don't know if that is because we're looking at a flyback or what are we looking at there. Also, don't know why we have a piece of plastic plunging through other than it must be to provide clearance, um, maybe high voltage clearance. Interesting, interesting. It's got to be. So this net here at the edge must have a decent amount of voltage going through it because they cut a hole in the board to prevent creepage and then shoved in a giant piece of plastic to provide uh, ample amounts of direct clearance. All right, so these connectors don't really know what they're called or who made them, but they accept the other parts. So this is our high voltage and we might need to go over to the microscope in a second here. From, yeah, I can't really tell with the light glaring the way it is. So let's use a different tool. Where is the changeover? No, I don't need that. I need this. Okay, so here's what we're looking at. We've got the two connectors, a uh, big jumper wire. I wonder if that's a few, oh, it's not a jumper wire. It's a component that's been heat shrunk. So I wonder if that is, yep, FR1. So I bet you that's a fuse. 
So after it goes in here, it hits this guy. Four pin diode with positive and negative marks. So this must be our rectifier. So you've got 120 volt rectified. Then it starts negative side. So this is their ground equivalent. We hit a big electrolytic capacitor. That looks like it might have suffered an impact from the sledge. Sorry about that big guy. Then from there, other side. Kind of a dirty little board. There's schmutz all over it. I wonder if that's flux or a conformal coating or what. And then a combination of part sizes. Really not a whole lot to this board. Nothing on here is showing me, um, I mean, granted, I don't know what this chip is, but I'm guessing that's just part of the power rectification circuit. But nothing on here is showing me anything that's smart enough to control USB 3 charging, which can negotiate a higher voltage with the host. Another filter cap out the back end. Two caps. Is that a varistor? All right. Well, I wasn't quite sure that we would do this, but I do have yet another battery charger. This is going to be a third in our looking around today. Um, one thing I'm noticing so far by taking all of these apart, these things are built pretty inexpensively. Single layer boards, two layer boards. Um, that's as cheap as you can possibly go. So let's see if there's anything around here. So here we've got a Maha MHC9000 Wizard 1 Charger Analyzer. This is supposedly a smart charger. It can do all sorts of stuff, recycle batteries, uh, deep discharge charge cycles to recondition. So it looks like I just need a regular old Phillips driver. We'll see what, if this one's a little more interesting than the last two. You never know till you open stuff up. I remember once I was tasked with taking apart a Polaroid camera. Uh, you've probably seen them. They're little, they're not the old school Polaroids, but the ones that came out like 10 years ago. Um, and I figured it's a Polaroid camera. What's in here? What could possibly be in here? You know, it's got a little blinky LED up in the viewfinder and that's about it. There was a surprising amount of circuitry. It was, I mean, there was a ton of stuff in there. So you never know. Okay. I'm feeling a little bit of resistance as I try to pull those apart. I assume that all of these things are loose and out, but you never know. So I got one more. Okay. I did have to work it out and now we are free and now we've got some circuitry baby all right this one came to play i like it this is another one where i would prefer to put it back together at the end my hope is that i can remove the circuit board and look at both sides of it without having to desolder terminals to the AA um, 
terminals, but I'm not entirely sure about that. And I won't know till I get all those board screws out. Okay, that looks like it. Okay, so now we are inside the Maha Charger, and let me get you a little bit of a bigger view. So this is what we're looking at on the side that the consumer sees. How is that connected? There is a, oh. Okay, I don't wanna take that out and risk breaking connection. But there is a little LCD panel and a backlit LED block behind it. But they connected it with the longest piece of, um, there's this material, and if you've ever taken apart an LCD, you can see it, but it, it's this rubber feeling material and it's a combination of conductor insulator conductor insulator conductor insulator uh, and I don't want to yank that off especially something this long I don't know if I can ever get it lined back up without making a jig so we've got inductors and they're spread relatively far apart but each one of these inductors seems to belong to each one of these battery things also of note is, for whatever reason, they pulled back their, their solder mask around the vias so that there is, let's see, where is a wrong microscope? They pulled back the solder mask around their vias so that there is the, it looks like Enig coating there. Uh, which is, it's fine. I, I just don't know why. Maybe they use their vias as test points as well. We'll find out a little more when we flip it over. All right. Now we've got quite a bit of fancy schmancy circuitry. We've got connected to the LCD. This is the bottom side of that. There is an IC with a ton of data lines. Uh, GPIO is running off of it. And those must be to control the LCD segments. There's quite a few that go all the way up here to these vias and then transfer over to that little grouping at the other side. At that point, they seem to run sideways. So here we've got a designer who likes doing the uh, vertical horizontal routing to move everything around. So from there, do those go in all in once? They go in all different directions. We're not going to know. But yeah, this is uh, one way that route some people who make boards love to do it. On one layer, they'll all go in one direction. In this case, it's largely vertical. And in the other direction, they'll go the other. In this case, predom predominantly horizontal. So anyhow, those ICs must run off to do something. You've got what appear to be FETs, these little three terminal devices that I assume form... Let's see how many there are. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, at least eight. Looks like there might be more than that. nine. So it could be that each one of those things runs half of an H-bridge driver. Uh, basically what you do for voltage uh, transformation, single coil voltage transformation, is you'll turn one on from the power source and that will charge up the coil and then you turn that one off and you turn another one on that discharges. And then while you're doing that you're monitoring the coil voltage. So you charge it up to one spot, discharge it to another, charge to one, discharge to another, charge to one, discharge to another, and on and on and on. And if you do that fast enough, you can get, uh, you, well, you can get pretty much any voltage you want, and you get pretty much any input voltage you want. 
Um, it just depends on the range of performance and the range of your sensors there. So my guess is then that they've got this IC, is it controlling all of these FETs? <laughs> it must be. By the way, if you have any comments, if you see something I don't, or you have something you want to ask questions about, feel free to ask in the comments. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I was looking for what might control these FETs, and I was just trying to follow some traces without knowing the pinouts of, of what's what, and there's just too many vias, so then I'm jumping around looking for one. See, I would think this bottom pin, uh, pin one, is the controlling ice is the controlling pin. But then it goes sideways, and then yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But one of these ICs has to be sensing the voltage and sending that information over to probably the big IC here, and then that IC is telling it when to turn on what FETs, you know, turn them on and off at what times to take advantage of the inductive. Okay. One thing, though, that I, I do find kind of odd um, and I don't typically recommend is, you know, see, for example, this big copper island out here. I, I would really like to see that tied to something. Um, anytime you have floating bits of copper, they can become antennas, uh, you know, especially in switching circuits. I wouldn't expect that to be a huge problem but it could certainly become a problem so the way that you do that is you just tie these pieces of copper these big un thing to the other side you just put a, a via you know every even you know quarter inch on center would be fine so interesting interesting and of course, if you're the designer, you can get these off the shelf, or usually you go to the factory and you tell them exactly what you want, or you can even work with them. All right, let's see if we can see the programming points or if they're hidden. How did they program that thing? There's a bunch of test points right there. And I guess they're using their vias as test points too. They're marked TP. So, that's why they're, they didn't use the solder mask. They're dual purposing them. One thing too, see how they kept the copper back well away from the, the hole there? So that way when you're, um, where did I put these screws? When you're putting your mounting screws in, you don't have to worry about potentially damaging the copper and short circuiting. So interesting, interesting. But yeah, uh, remember those chips I showed you earlier? These silicone wafers that have all those chips on them? You, oh, let's see, there we go. Do you remember those? Those get put in cases just like this and bonded with little tiny wires to these lead frames that we then attach all our components to. So, anyhow, I think that's pretty much it. It's interesting. This was a day of chargers, a day of stuff to look at that was fun. And now I get to put it all back together. So while I'm doing that, anybody out there in TV land have any questions about anything that we saw today? Please feel free to ask. It only takes me a second to read your question and ignore it answer it you're not gonna know you're not gonna know Christian if you were watching today I hope you enjoyed when I mark smashed that Amazon charger I know that's always a, a favorite of yours oh you know something I bet you those corner ones are gonna be the case screws let's just stick to the internals all right um, please remember, we are facing a silicone shortage, and as electronics engineers, that means that uh, 
the stuff that you want to use may or may not be available when you want to use it. The solution to that is to buy it now, have it shipped to your assembly shop. For example, Advanced Assembly, you can uh, let your salesperson know that you know, you're going to be doing this design. Maybe it's a few weeks off, a month off, whatever. Say, hey, can you guys hold on to these parts for me? Put them into uh, temperature controlled storage so that you don't have any worries. You won't have to worry about your chips getting damaged or shocked with uh, ESD discharge, anything like that. And then when you're ready to use them, we'll pull them off, load them up into our picking place, and Bob's your uncle. Off you go. And then other than that, um, the latest projections that I've heard about, and if you guys know different, let me know, but the latest I've heard about for this silicone charger to be over is next summer, early next summer. That's when we'll start seeing parts return to regular inventory. Manufacturers, um, IC component manufacturers, have learned from this, and they will certainly be ramping up production, but everything these days has a microchip in it. Everything. So there's more demand, um, more people make designing stuff and building stuff. It's getting hard. It's going to be hard. Now, for those of you that joined late, I would like to remind you that on teachmepcb.com, we are, how did I lose that? I've seriously moved nowhere. But we are designing, <coughs> excuse me, um, keyboards. You can make your own, any shape or size. I made mine into a brain shape. Um, it's a free course. We're going to give away as many parts as we can, uh, give away as many boards as we can afford. It's going to depend on the level of commitment from our sponsors which isn't really written into contracts yet. I'm, I'm still working on that. But it starts October 11th. So if you want to join, uh, we're going to have Keysight. We're going to have Advanced Assembly. We're going to have Royal Circuits. We'll have ooh, a cool website called Walkwi, W-O-K-W-I. Uh, a uh, friend of mine, Yuri Shaked, has created a brilliant simulator for Arduino and the Picos. You guys don't even have to do you know the breadboarding anymore, and you can figure out if your design's going to work. But come check out teachmepcb.com. Send us your parts. We'll be happy to hold on to them for you. And uh, other than that, if you're not doing anything next week, come join me at Mark Voids a Warranty. And if you have ideas for future teardowns or there's something more you want to see, I'm starting to run out of things that I'm willing to just destroy, right? Um, that's what I've been doing so far. I've had broken stuff. I just yank it and take it apart and throw throw it away in the trash and pin the boards to my wall as an example to the others. But if you have ideas, interesting things that you want to know more about, please shoot me an email, uh, mhughes at aapcb.com. And if you have any designs that you'd need help making, just shoot us a mail, um, sales at aapcb.com. We are happy to help you out in any way that we can. All right, well, thank you so much for joining Mark voids a warranty. Remember, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your friends' neighbors, and tell your neighbors' friends about Mark Voids a Warranty, most Fridays at noon Pacific. Take care, everyone.